Church, hope you're doing well today. Uh, I'm excited for this uh, chili cook-off. I don't think I've ever been, uh, seen so much friendly competition here in the church. I like it. It's going to be like a year's worth of bragging rights, so there's a lot on the line here. <clears throat> well, I am, I am so glad that you are in church. I'm so glad you're with us this morning. Uh, I want you to experience the presence of the Lord and be encouraged in your faith as we worship God together. Uh, I hope that as we were lifting up praise to God, you could tell that that was more than just enthusiasm. I hope you could tell that it wasn't just people getting riled up about something, but that something was different in this place. That where the Bible says where two or more are gathered, Jesus says, I'm there. I hope you could tell the Lord was present among us as we were lifting up. He was inhabiting the praises of his people. And he does that because he's faithful. It's not because we're so good, it's because he's so good that he comes and he rests among us. And you know, sometimes in church we can think of worship as the warm-up for the sermon. That's not really how I look at worship. I look at worship as giving worth to a God who is worthy. And in eternity, it says we're going to be praising him. In scripture, it says if we don't praise him, the rocks would cry out. That he is so worthy, deserving of worship and praise that creation, if we did not worship him, would have to praise him. And I don't want to be outdone by any rocks. I love it when we lift up our voices and we worship his name and you can sense that the Lord is near and he's working among us. I hope that you could sense that as well. Well, again, good to be with you. We are in Genesis chapter 15 today. You can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, We're looking at sola fide. This is faith alone. This is the role that faith plays in our salvation. The idea here, as we're going to see, is that faith alone is what justifies us before God. Now, that word justifies, when I use that, what that means is makes us right. Faith alone is what makes us right before God. We talked last week about how all of us are born spiritually dead and that it's by grace that God awakens us to new life. That takes place when we place our faith in Christ. And so faith is the only way to be declared righteous before God. It's the only way that we can be made right before a perfect and holy God. We can't earn it. We can't be good enough. It is by grace through faith that we come to the knowledge, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let me open us in prayer and we'll jump right into our passage and just get right to it this morning. God, I pray that as we open your word today that Father, you would help me to convey these deep truths in a way that speak to our hearts. I pray you would be with us, that you would bless us, that God, your word would find home in our hearts and that God, you would strengthen us in our faith this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 15, 1 through 21. I'm going to read through this, but our focus is going to primarily be on verses 1 through 6, and then I'll jump to the end of the passage at the very end of the sermon. It says, After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can, can you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram continued, look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him, this one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from the land, from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, Lord God, how can I know that I will possess it? He said to him, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So he brought all these to him, cut them in half, and laid the pieces opposite each other. But he did not cut the birds in half. 
Birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, a deep sleep came over Abram, and suddenly great terror and darkness descended on him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know this for certain, your offspring will be resident aliens for 400 years in a land that does not belong to them and will be enslaved and oppressed. However, I will judge the nation they serve, and afterward they will go out with many possessions. But you will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, I give this land to your offspring from the brook of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Kadamites, Hethites, Perizzites, Raphaim, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. So that's a long passage of scripture to read. Let me give a, a brief overview of what we see taking place in this passage. God is creating a covenant with Abram, and he's promising him that he will have descendants and that they will take possession of the land that Abram is currently in. Now, when we look at this passage, what stands out when we initially read it is not the strength of Abram's faith. No, just the opposite. Abram has all kinds of doubts and questions. He has not yet become Abraham, the father of faith. He's still Abram, a man who has doubts. God comes to him and says, I'll be your shield. He says, what can you give me? He says, I'll give you all this land to your descendants. And what does Abram say in response? How do I know I'll really possess it? So Abram is not a man of strong faith at this point. He has doubts. He has questions. He's not sure God is going to entirely come through on what God has said that he will do. You know, I'm so thankful that God accepts us, that God loves us, that God works with us wherever we are in our faith. Aren't you thankful that wherever you are in your faith, whether you feel like you're a towering figure of great strength, which probably none of us feel that way, or whether you feel like your faith is just that of, of a little budding flower that has yet to come into full fruition, Wherever you are, God loves us, he accepts us, he works with us wherever we are on that spectrum. I take great encouragement from this. Abram is like, God, how are you gonna, how are you gonna do this? God, how can I be sure? And God meets him right where he is. He works with him where he is. You know, I read a story this past week of missionaries Robert and Mary Moffat for 10 years they labored faithfully in what is now called Botswana without any encouragement, without any signs of fruit. They served in Botswana for 10 years without a single person coming to faith. The International Mission Board wondered, or excuse me, the mission board that they served under wondered, is there, is there gonna be any fruit? Should we pull them from the mission field? Should we just kinda abandon this particular post and focus on other areas? But they decided we wanna stay. I want to stay here and continue the ministry. A year later, there was still no fruit. Another year later, still no fruit. Finally, a friend from England reaches out to them and says, hey, I just want to send you a gift. Mrs. Moffat says, I want you to send me a communion set because I believe that we're going to need it soon, that God is going to rescue people out of darkness and bring them into life and we'll be receiving communion together. We don't have a communion set, so send me that as a gift. They send, she sends the set, and it gets stuck in the mail. Before it arrives, six people come to Christ, and they now have their first church, but they don't have their communion set. It arrives the day before they were scheduled to have their first church service and receive communion with the first church in Botswana. It was just a little bit of faith God works with a little bit of faith, church. Maybe you feel like you don't have the strength to move mountains. Maybe you feel like your faith is just this small thing. God works with us when we just have a little bit of faith. 
We see in this passage that God is honored by faith and God honors faith, even when it's just the smallest amount. Let's dig into this passage and I wanna draw a few things out of it. Our first observation is gonna be this. Faith conquers fear. Faith conquers fear. The passage begins with this. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Abram has just managed to achieve a huge victory. Just to recap a little bit of the history from Genesis chapter 14, you remember that at one point, Lot and Abram, their, their flocks become too large to be supported by one area of land. And so they decide to separate. Now, if, if you're new to studying the Bible, Lot is Abraham's nephew. And so Abraham, Abram says to, to Lot, hey, you choose the area that you want and I'll choose the other area. Lot chooses the more choice looking land for taking care of the animals and he settles in the area of Sodom. You've heard about Sodom and Gomorrah, these cities that were famed for, for how depraved they were. Well, that's where Lot decides to settle. Now the area, this area is overseen by a king who lives in modern day Iran. And he has huge, huge influence over this area. And for 12 years, he's basically the person in charge until the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and a couple other areas decide to rebel against him. And they rebel against him. And this king, along with a few other kings, come and completely subdue Sodom and Gomorrah and that area. They ransack Sodom and they take people from Sodom. Well, where does Lot live? He lives in Sodom. And so Lot is one of the people that is kidnapped by this king, taking basically probably to be a slave along with all kinds of plunder. Abram hears about his nephew being kidnapped and he gathers 300 men and they go after this person. Now think about this, think about this for a moment. This is a king that if you were to go from where Abram is all the way to where he was in Iran, that's about 800 miles. This is a king that has significant influence. This is a king who's just defeated five other kings. And Abram's gonna go after him with 300 men? He does. He pursues them. They attack them at night. And Abram is able to defeat him and rescue Lot from this person. So Abram has just come off of a huge victory, but he lives in an area and a time that is known for retribution, for vengeance, and so he's worried. And God says to him, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. This is the first time we see the phrase, do not be afraid in the Bible or fear not in the Bible. It occurs about 70 times in scripture. Abram is coming off an amazing victory, but he's not sure if he's actually safe. And God says, do not be afraid. I am your shield. You know, isn't it interesting that we can have victories in life, we can have success in life, and we can still be gripped by fear and worry. We can see things go our way in life. We can have some wins. We can be successful, and still fear and worry can grip our lives. You know, our reaction to fear tends to be either fight or flight. We think to ourselves, I'm either gonna fight against this fear or I'm gonna run away from it. But you know the antidote to fear is not fighting it and trying to control the circumstance. It's not running from it. Faith is the antidote to fear. Ephesians 6 says it this way. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Faith in God is a shield against fear and worry. Faith in God guards us when everything around us says this is not gonna end up well. When everything in life says this is not gonna go our way, faith in God is this shield that protects us. The shield that Paul was likely envisioning in Ephesians 6 is the Roman shield. It was called a scutum. It was a full body shield. It wasn't this round shield that just kind of guarded your upper body, it was a full body shield that would go from upper body all the way down to their shins. And what they would do is the front line would hold this shield and then the people behind them would, would raise it over their head and as one unit they would move forward and it was almost, it, it was basically impenetrable because arrows, the shield actually went all the way kind of around their body. That's what Paul is saying, faith in God is. It is this shield that protects us 
that guards us, that keeps us. <clears throat> you know, I, I never really grow tired of the story of John Patton, missionary to New Hebrides, now known as Vanuatu. Before he went, he was told that he'll be eaten alive by cannibals. That if he goes and takes the gospel to the New Hebrides Islands, he'll be eaten by cannibals. I love his response. The man who was telling him this was named Mr. Uh, Dixon. He was an older man. And this is what he says in response to, to what Mr. Dixon had told him. He says, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is soon to be laid in the grave, there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I can but live and die serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. <laughs> he went down, evangelized the New Hebrides Islands. At one point, there's a story that they literally were trying to kill him. He climbs up into a chestnut tree and hides in this tree, and he can hear gunshots and people running underneath him, searching for him. Years later, he said that if he could go back to that tree where he experienced the peace of Jesus like never before, he would go. Church, faith is a shield. Today, Vanuatu is one of the most Christian areas in the world. The islands came to know Jesus. If you go there, the warmest, kindest people, people that previously would have killed people, eaten them, now worshiping Jesus. He should have been afraid, but do you see, church, Faith in God, it's a shield. God says, I'm your shield. I'll protect you. I wonder how that would change the things that we worry about, change our outlook on life if we believe that God, whatever I face, whatever challenges, you are my shield. Faith in God is the antidote to our fears. Second observation we make today is God's promises are always sure. God's promises are sure. Verse 2, but Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I'm childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram continued, look, you've given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now, this is interesting. God says, don't be afraid. I'm your shield. Your reward will be great. And what is Abram's response? What can you give me? I don't have an heir. He's basically saying that anything you give me is going to be lost on me because I don't have anyone to inherit it. This servant of mine is going to get everything. Now, at this point, it's been 10 years since God first told Abram that he would build him into a great nation. Abram has wealth, he has success, he has respect, he's had victories, but he doesn't have a child. Both he and his wife are getting older. And so he's, he looks at the circumstances of his life. What does he do? He does the math. He looks at what's logical. He looks at what makes sense. And what makes sense is you've given me these things, but I don't have an heir, so it's all going to go to my servant. What does God tell him in response to this? This one will not be your heir. Instead, one comes, who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look at the sky and count the stars if you are able to count them. <clears throat> Then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Abram tells God, whatever you give me, it's just going to go to my servant. God says, don't look at what's around you. Look up to the heavens. Church, far too often, when we're gripped by fear, when we're gripped by worry, we look at what makes sense. We look at the circumstances. We look at <clears throat> and what we can see, and God says, look up to the heavens. Look up to me. So often, church, our focus is on what we can make, what we can put together. And God says, look up to me. Now, don't get me wrong, a Christian faith is not incompatible with reason. But there are times when logic and reason and faith are like a fork in the road. And to pursue God and follow faith is, is going to be to do things that doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense for Abram to leave his homeland, but he stepped out in faith. 
It didn't make sense for David to go up against Goliath with just some stones. He stepped out in faith. It didn't make sense for Deborah to go out with the army, but she had faith. It didn't make sense for Ruth to leave her homeland and be a foreigner, but she stepped out in faith. It didn't make sense for Gideon to fight the Midianites with 300 men, but he did it in faith. It didn't make sense for Peter to step out of the boat in the storm, but by faith he walked on water. Church, there are times when when the circumstances around you say one thing, and if you will look up to the heavens and look at God, you'll see something completely different. There are times where we shouldn't predict the outcome based on what we can see, but based on what God says, amen? Final observation we see here is that faith is what brings righteousness. Verse six, Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. The word for righteous here means just, but spiritually speaking, what it means is is to be made perfect before God, to be upright before God, that is without sin, that would separate us from God. And so Abram, despite all his doubts, believes in God when he says, this is gonna be your inheritance, and God declares him a righteous man. Now, what's amazing here is that if you know the story of Abram, up until this point, he's been anything but a righteous man. I mean, God calls him to leave his homeland He goes to the land of the Canaanites. There's a famine in the land. And do you know what he does? Does he stay where God has called him? No. He looks at the circumstances and he says, you know what? This doesn't make sense to stay here. Let's go down to Egypt. As he approaches Egypt, do you know what he tells his wife? He says, honey, you're a beautiful woman. You're so attractive that there's going to be men that might want to kill me to marry you. So don't tell everyone that we're married. Tell everybody that you're my sister. So Sarah does it. Pharaoh decides to take Sarah, Sarai, as his wife, and that's literally what it says in the text, that he took her as his wife, which implies that everything that is commonly associated with marriage likely took place in this union, and to curry favor with who he thinks is the brother, Pharaoh starts sending Abram all these gifts camels, donkeys, servants, because he wants to get in good with his brother-in-law. You see what he's doing? He's benefiting from his wife being exploited and being married to another man. I mean, how would a man look at himself even in the mirror? It's like you receive all these gifts and you think to yourself, I'm getting this at my wife's expense. This is the man that God credits as righteous when he places his faith in him. This is the man that when he places faith, God considers him perfectly upright and without sin. And church, the beauty of this is that this is a picture of what God does for us. When we place our faith in Christ, even though we all have a past, God washes it away, wipes the slate clean, and makes us righteous. Amen? Let me talk about this faith for a moment, see if I can capture it a little bit in an illustration. I brought a couple of things here with me. I have a security blanket, compliments of my two-year-old son. He doesn't use this one as much anymore. And I've got a life preserver, compliments of my boat that never goes in the water. So the boat's not missing it at all. Faith in Christ is less like a security blanket and more like a life preserver, okay? Now think about this for a minute. What what does a child use their security blanket for? For comfort, right? Just a little bit of comfort. I mean, Daniel, if if you give him this, he'll, he'll grip it right before he goes to bed and he'll hold on to it. And as soon as he falls asleep, you know, he kind of pushes it out of the way. But for about a good five or 10 minutes, he'll hold on to this thing and it gives him a little bit of comfort. A life preserver, by contrast, you use this if you're stuck in the ocean. I mean, if somebody falls off the boat, if this is, you, legally you have to have this in your boat, 
so that you can throw it to someone should they fall in the ocean. If you're stranded in the sea, this isn't going to just be a source of comfort. This is going to be like what keeps you from drowning because you can tread the water for maybe four or five, six hours, but pretty soon your body's going to get tired and eventually you're going to drown. And you wouldn't think it, but here in Hawaii, the water is cool enough that eventually even hypothermia will get you. And so this, this is your lifeline. Faith in Christ is less like this and more like this. God calls us not to view faith as something that just provides a little bit of comfort, just provides me a little solace, just gives me a little peace of mind. God calls us to have a faith that holds on to a, like, like holding on to a life preserver. That if I'm in the ocean, I'm gripping this thing, I'm holding on to it, it doesn't matter if it's rough, I'm not letting this thing go. And church, here's the thing. This will not save you at all if you're in the ocean. It won't do you any good. This could save your life. Church, we are called to a faith that is more like this and less like this. You see, here's, here's the application of the illustration. All of us, God's word says, are born into a sea of sin. And this kind of faith isn't going to save you. A faith that you just hold on to for a little bit of comfort, but then let go when times get good, that's not going to save you. We have to take hold of faith. We have to grip it. We have to have a faith that is grounded in a truth that, man, it doesn't matter when, when things get a little bit better, when the water is storming a little bit less, I'm not letting this go. Now think about this for a minute. If you were in the ocean and it's storming at night, but in the morning things get calm, would you throw this away? Would you say, oh, okay, well, the storm's gone. I think I'll, I don't need this anymore. No, you're going to hold on to it because you know without this, I'm going to drown. Church, that is how we're to hold on to faith, that I got to hold on to this thing when it's rough and when it's calm because this is what's going to keep me alive because I was born into a sea of sin and I will drown. But if I hold on to faith in Jesus Christ, I am made righteous before God. All my sins are gone. All my sins are removed. A pastor of mine described verse 6 as the most amazing thing, the most amazing deal in the, in, the, in the whole Bible, that we could come before God broken, sinful, having done all kinds of things we're not proud of, and we put faith in him, and he credits us with the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. He's like, that's the best deal you'll ever find that God would trade your sin for the perfection of Jesus Christ. And so we hold on to this, not like a little security blanket that gives us peace at times, but as something that our lives depend on. Let me close by looking at the latter portion of this passage briefly. There's a portion of this passage that when we read it gets a little bit confusing to us. God says, bring me these animals and Abram does and he cuts them up and places them opposite one another. And we read that and we're like, man, what's going on here? This just sounds odd to me. Well, this was a common custom in this region of the world at this particular time. In the ancient Near East, they, they struck a deal by doing this, okay? So we strike a deal by signing our lives away, okay? The way they struck a deal was by cutting animals in half and then the weaker party would walk between them. Now, think about a borrower and a lender. Who's the stronger? It's the lender, right? The borrower is the weaker party. So say somebody was borrowing money from someone else in the ancient Near East, in Abram's day. What they would do is they would cut these animals in half, and then the weaker party, the one who's more likely to default, the borrower, would walk between the dead animals, and it was this symbolic ritual that basically said, may this happen to me if I don't fulfill my end of the bargain. So if I don't pay you back the loan, may I become like these animals. May I die. And this was the common practice for how they struck a deal. I mean, 150 years ago, we shook hands. Well, 4,000 years ago, this is what they did. <clears throat> now, something interesting happens in this passage. Who passes between the dead animals in this passage? Is it Abram? It's not, is it? God passes through. 
God passes between these dead animals. Here's the significance of this. This is what God is saying. Abram, if you don't keep up your end of the bargain, I'll be the one who's cut and dies. And this is a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ because all of us have failed to keep up our end of the bargain. All of us have sinned and God is the one who is cut and dies for our sins. So what God has done here in this passage, he's put this beautiful picture of the cross that when you fail, I'll be the one who suffers and I'll uphold your end of the bargain and save you. That's the gospel, church. And it's when we place faith in God that we experience salvation. Did you join me in prayer? God, we, we look to your word, Father, and we, we find such encouragement, such hope in it, Lord. God, I pray that, that God, our, our faith would not be like the security blanket that just gives us comfort, though, God, we do receive great comfort from it, but that, God, we would cling to it as our greatest source of hope, that, God, we would hold on to it knowing that, Father, when the waters are rough, when the waters are calm, we need you all the same. Lord, I pray you would strengthen us and, and ground us in the knowledge of the truth that you love us and you've died for our sins. And, God, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful picture of the cross that even when we fail, even when we don't uphold our end of the bargain, you demonstrated your love for us by going to the cross for our sake. Church, if you're here this morning and, and maybe you need to talk or pray with someone, maybe you need to take a step of faith, maybe you need to be sure that you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I would love to pray with you this morning. I'll be in the back as we respond and worship. Please come back and join me.